Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Just like our Excuse me, anybody who's county staff that's not presenting, uh, you can go up to our conference room and MIS because we've over we're, we're over capacity here. So county staff, please go up to MIS conference room for the spillover YouTube. Thank you. Call the meeting to order. Ma'am, if you would close that back door, please. I don't think she heard you. That's Susanna. I'm going to go take care of it for you. Somebody's got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the meeting has been called to order. Uh, if we will all bow our heads, I have the honors to this, this meeting. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this meeting, these commissioners, and all of Alamance County. Our country needs your direction and your help, and we pray that you guide this meeting in our deliberations. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm not sure who has the uh, peanut butter and, and drink concessions, but they're going to make a lot of money today. It's a big crowd. <laughs> we welcome everyone. Uh, everyone has looked at the agenda. Do we have a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Looking at public speakers, it appears that we have four, but only one appears to be on agenda. Um, having talked to one of the speakers, he may also be on agenda, but uh, I'm going to leave it just the way it is unless somebody objects. Um, we have Paul Williams, who is on agenda. Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. You have three minutes, sir. All right. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. I'm here today to express to you my concerns as it relates to the veterans of Alamance and surrounding counties that have served our great country, need support to transition into civilian life. My goal for speaking today is to request that each of you support and approve the funding for the Veterans Community Project to come to Alamance County. It is my understanding that the county already owns the land that the Tiny Homes Community, community would, would occupy. My concern is this. I read the big Alamance News article regarding the new $100, $100 million Alamance County Courthouse. Can you, can you tell me why you are not hesitant to spend this large amount of money? It appears to me that you have no problem spending $100 million for judges, lawyers, and criminals 
but question $6.5 million for homeless veterans. And I say homeless veterans. Just in case anyone needs a reminder of what a veteran is, I would like to share. A veteran is someone who at one point wrote a blank check payable to the United States of America for an amount of up to and including their life. Please explain to me and the other citizens of this county why you would not approve this funds, this uh, veterans community project with free money from the COVID that the county received to support the men and women who fought for this country's freedom. As I was driving into Graham from 87 South, I saw a billboard, Mr. Turner's, for re-election. First word on there says, veterans. You've had a family member that was a veteran. You have. I don't know about you two gentlemen. But we all, it's all touched our lives some way, shape, form, or fashion. But I personally would like to ask y'all to take care of our veterans of Alamax County. This is, a, this is something that we truly need. And it's kind of like groundbreaking, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. And I think they've got some one presentation a little bit later on Zoom. They can tell you more about that. But me as a citizen of Alamance County, that's a win-win for everybody. When, you know, when you go somewhere and you've got these government buildings, it's got these bronze plaques up. It says, you know, dedicated to so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. Then it's got commissioners, da-da-da. It'd be nice to see that, that bronze plaque with Mr. Craig Turner, Steve Carter, John Paisley, Bill Lashley, and Pamela Thompson. That's commissioners that approve that. And people from generations on your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren could look and say, hey, that was my grandfather's. That was my grandmother. That approved this to help the veterans. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The other three speakers I've been told were not on agenda, but I'll ask the three without mentioning your names. Do you think, if you think you're on the agenda, um, then come forward now. Okay. Uh, Councilman Bobby Chen is, is next, and we're going to show you as on agenda. Since you talked to me earlier, I know yes. that you are on the agenda. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am here today to acknowledge the support that was provided by the Alamance County Transportation Authority in helping us take care of a veteran Friday. It was a situation requiring an immediate need, and they stepped up and provided a vehicle to take this veteran. And we had him, when we got him to the VA, uh, we were able to get him checked in where he's gonna be uh, evaluated and uh, an assessment made. And secondly, I'd like to thank the county commissioners and Sheriff Johnson for the support you've been giving us in regards to Chestnut Ridge, as well as the van that you've given us uh, unfortunately, we couldn't use the van to transport the veteran because he didn't have the strength to get into the van. And so thankfully, the ACTA was able to send one of their wheelchair-capable vans, and they took care of it. So at this time, I would like to give each of you a sticker for being a supporter of Alco Vets. I just saw the director for ACTA here just a few minutes ago. He must have been gone into the overflow room. Thank you very much. And I apologize. That was not on the agenda. Uh, that was my error. I th thought you were going to talk about something else. I apologize. No, not a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. The other two... Um, Ramona Williams and Tim uh, Spears, are they on agenda or off agenda? Are y'all uh, talking about the Friendship Center at this meeting? We are not. Yeah. So that'll be off agenda. Thank you. Okay. Next, we can have I, the... Can I ask a question really quick? I'm Ramona Williams. Oh, yes, um, ma'am. So I was told that we were going to be talking about friendship. Does that mean 
you get to speak at the end where it's public or yes, you're not going to hear anything about No, you will be able to speak at the end. Thank you, both of you. <coughs> Commissioner responses. Okay, consent agenda. Motion um, to approve. Uh, let me just say on the agenda, we made a couple of uh, changes because of a typo, and that's been corrected. So if we can approve it with that correction of a typo. And we have a motion to approve by Mr. Carter. Second. And a second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Again, unanimous. Thank you. Okay, next is soil and water and Brad Moore. Mr. Moore, good to see you. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners. So I think uh, most of you are at our uh, rollout presentation of the uh, Preservation Alamance program back on November 9th. We've uh, been very busy since then and it was nice to see you all out there at that day. Um, since that time, we've been working with uh, Deborah Bechtrel. We've updated our uh, brochure to make sure it's proper and up to date and it's currently with PIP printing and I anticipate it being um, printed either this week or next week and we'll be working with the county uh, print shop to help get that mailed out to around our 1200 or so landowners who participate in the PUV program. Um, also since that meeting we've had a few people come forward who are interested in our program and we've been meeting with them gathering information and in kind of the early stages of those these types of projects. In April the VAD board approved uh, that we could have allowed us uh, approval to start working on some of these projects and we've had uh, right now currently the three projects we're starting on is a 73 acre farm 83 acre and a 93 excuse me 96 acre farm totaling around 252 acres these numbers will fluctuate just a little bit because a few acres will be cut out here and there for various things these landowners that have come forward at this time um, wish to donate a conservation on their property while retaining ownership. Uh, this particular one is the county will not be owning the property or anything of that nature in the future. Um, so in that particular program the county funds will be used for legal costs, surveying, things of that nature. Since the program is new and every situation and every farm is different, we continue to work with uh, Deborah Bechtel and the county, newer county legal staff, uh, just to make sure we're handling things uh, properly. Because uh, as many of you are familiar with this type of thing, it, it can be quite complicated and we just try to assist the landowners the best way we can. Um, also, we are currently working with the VAD board at this time. Uh, we have to adopt a easement language. That's the, the teeth of conservation easements that says what you can and can't do on a property once you preserve it and uh, put it under uh, the conservation easement. So at our July meeting, um, I anticipate the VAD board will move forward with adopting that language and basically that'll give us what we need to move forward and with hopes, I hope to have at least one project closed before the end of the year in December. I think Mr. Love has a few updates for the VAD board. Thank you. Smart guy. He didn't sit down in case we had questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you for giving us a chance to talk about the preservation elements in the Voluntary Ag District. So, uh, I'm Steve Love. I'm chairman of the Voluntary Ag District, and uh, we was asked to give you a little update on what's going on. And the Voluntary Ag District was established in 2001. And since that establishment, we have 19,324 acres enrolled in the Voluntary Ag District. Now that program, you know, is, is voluntary. People can come in and out as they want to, but that shows you an interest that we have in preserving the farmland in Alamance County. And the commissioners has been very instrumental in helping set this program up as well as 
preservation elements that Brad just spoke on. The all, both these programs are going through the Volunteer Ag District. And it's being administrative, and we've, uh, Brad's done a lot of work to get everything right and get the paperwork right, and my hat's off to him. But um, the Voluntary Ag District has preserved a total in permanent preservation of 561.22 acres. Now that's that land is permanently preserved. It'll always be farmland. And we anticipate closing on 56.16 acres within the next two weeks. And the county has uh, $59,618.88 invested in this project. And uh, two of our farm applications was uh, selected by the state last year for permanent preservation. So uh, I don't know if all of you know how this works. The county's got money in it, the state's got money in it, and the landowner donates part of the development rights. But now with the preservation Alamance, uh, I think Brad will agree with you, that gives us some more leverage that we can do stuff on our own without having to wait on the state uh, if the funds are available. So we have to manage that too. Uh, one of the farms is 72.16 uh, acres and the other is 49.77 acres. Both of these farms had a, have an estimated investment from the county of a $116,466.75 for both of them. Uh, once these farms close, we'll have a total of 739.31 acres in permanent protected farmland. And we currently have three applications that we sent to the state, so we're waiting to hear from them to see if they get approved. And uh, I think they're waiting on a new budget to pass in July or August, so. If you got any questions, I'll try to answer. Just one thing, are you seeing these farms being in one certain part of the county or are they spread all over? Uh, no, they're kind of they're kind of spread all over, would you say? Yes, ma'am. I guess uh, there's there's interest all over the county. There there'll be spells where we might have a hot spot possibly in a in a southern area or it could be in a northern and a lot of it is kind of word of mouth or neighbor, so uh, they'll get to talking and there may be a, an interest, but it is all over. And as Brad told you, we have some people that's interested in preserving their farm because none of the family is interested in it and they don't want to see it develop. So now with the preservation elements, we have a tool that we can work with to help these people. So uh, is there any other questions? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Love, uh, I know there have also been some talk about connecting young farmers or folks who want to be who want to be farmers who are young with with, like you mentioned, properties where folks might not want to continue farming. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, the the farmers in Alamance County is an aging. We don't have a lot of young people that's interested in that. So yeah, we need to make some land available to these beginning in new farmers and that's that's a possibility with this I mean uh, we've had a lot of interest in that preservation element since it was rolled out last November mm -hmm. so I think as we get along more with it you know we can we can come up with some better ideas on how to do this Mr. Turner yeah. thank you is there any other questions I just wanted to say you guys did a great job on VAG Amos now Mr. Moore was the shining well, star. We all know that uh, <laughs> Frank Bell was hot that day. And so, but I would encourage you to do that again and get one of your farmers that has gone through this process to really talk about their experience because it's <clears> just <throat> like you said, it's a real win win. Well, we appreciate everything that the county has done to instrument this program, both of them. Are you from Southern Alamance? I am. Yeah. Did you have a kid <coughs> Robbie Love? That's my brother. Yeah. I had the biggest crush on him in middle school. Oh that's so crazy. I'll be sure and tell him when be I get sure. back. <laughs> he will probably go, oh my God. And, uh, He's a great athlete. Yes. And, and Mr. Lashley's been real instrumental. He's been to every voluntary ag district meeting that uh, that I've been at. So uh, we, we appreciate the interest. Mm -hmm. You know, ACC has a agricultural program too. And uh, brings young people into getting trained, and uh, 
might be an opportunity to let you may and you may already be doing that linking those linking this program and that program well, together I will tell you this we partnered with the uh, Piedmont Land Conservancy and they bring a lot of experience and they've really helped us out a lot so anytime we can partner with somebody it makes everything a lot stronger mm -hmm. Is there any other questions? Just thank you for being so committed. Definitely. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moore. All right. We appreciate thank it. You, thank brother. you, Mr. Moore. Don't tell your brother. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Baker. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Uh, I have before you today a resolution uh, in support of designating the Hall River Trail as a state trail. Um, so, you guys are familiar with the Harbor Trail, and we've been at this for 15, 20 years now with the support and cooperation of the state. So they've been a part of the Harbor Trail from the beginning. Um, over the past few years, they have come up with a new uh, designation for some of these long-term trails throughout the state. They make them an official state trail, which means that they are an official part of the uh, state parks um, unit with the state. Uh, doesn't make a huge difference as far as the construction or management or day-to-day -day operations of the trail um, and thus far for the past five or six years it hasn't seemed like something we needed to do um, in this last budget uh, they passed a significant amount of trail funding um, and made that exclusively for state trails um, and that has made those of us who are not state trails um, <laughs> anxious to become state trails um, so it's not um, only for Alamance, so this involves includes Rockingham and uh, Guilford and Chatham County as well. Um, it has to be a state action to make this a state trail, but they like to see some local support. Uh, so we're asking for you guys to approve this resolution to support making the Harbor Trail a state trail and opening up some of those funding avenues for us in the future. And we just don't read the entire resolution, but if you would highlight that for those who are listening. Sure. Uh, th this uh, speaks to the cooperation that we've had with all the jurisdictions um, along the Harbor Trail uh, for the past, since the first uh, memorandum of understanding that we signed in 2006, um, discusses how we go, ahead, go about building the Harbor Trail, working with private landowners and the benefits of the Harbor Trail and connecting people to the land, giving them a place to exercise and really showcasing the river um as the place that our county grew and uh became what we are today uh, so just some of those highlights and uh, indicating that um, this board will support making the harvard trail a state trail uh, at the state legislature i've had some comments made to me recently about uh, from individuals who one in particular lives right across the street to one of the entrances to the trail and said she and her husband get out there almost every morning and walk parts of that trail so hmm really love what we've done down in the cane creek area so great i uh, i uh, made the mistake of paddling the entire river this past weekend <laughs> uh, 56 miles was a little more than i should bite off in my age uh, but the diversity of people and the amount of people out there just enjoying most of them were not doing what i was doing for good reasons um but just spending the day out there it's amazing uh, the impact it's having just on individuals did my shipmate Nolan go with you? He made, I dragged him along. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I dragged him. He's a lot younger than I am and uh, has a lot better endurance, but. Uh, He's, he was in a boat with me. That's well, the intestinal will that some of the, the older folks have. So we made it together. That's right. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this resolution. Second. Okay. We have two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Brian. Our health director is next. I didn't even see Tony. To remain nameless except for Tony. No. <laughs> Fair Tony, enough. You literally look like an FBI agent. A what? <laughs> FBI agent? <laughs> That'd be cool. <laughs> quite the queer, quite the queer shift. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, morning, Commissioner. So uh, you may or may not recall, last August, uh, you approved and signed on to the MOA for the opioid settlement between the uh, state of North Carolina and local governments. Um, so.
today we're getting pretty well actually today but we're getting pretty close to receiving our first uh, payment of those settlement funds so today we're um, before you are two items regarding the settlement funds first we'll be asking for your approval for a special revenue fund ordinance in the amount of eight million eight hundred seventy four thousand seven hundred and thirty three dollars and then the second piece of this commissioners will hear a presentation um, and receive just a brief overview of the MOA, but also for you all to start considering how you may want to start expending these funds in the future. So you'll hear that. You'll hear what staff recommendations are uh, for these expenditures. Expenditures again; these are just for your considerations to make the decision later on down the road. And then the last piece before I turn it over to uh, Ashley, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention. Um, that Miss Deborah Bechtel had a very heavy hand um, in helping bring this uh, agreement together. Ashley and I attended the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners um, conference or symposium that they did a few weeks ago. And they did a little overview how this came together, um, starting really in January 2020 with all the counties getting together and then the subcommittee of the 555 group that Deborah was a part of. And the um, I, it'd just be an understatement if I try to sit here and try to tell you all the work that they had go in to do this and weekly if not probably daily meetings just amazing amazing feat to get everybody on board and moving in the right direction to do what positively benefits the state of north carolina and alamance county so super shout out kudos to deborah for being a part of that so we're happy to have her here and another expert close by so and with that said i will turn it over to ashley motley to i uh, give you the overview thank you good morning ashley good morning good morning, good morning. So Ashley Motley, Coordinator for Health Services, and today I'm going to present to you an overview of uh, the North Carolina Opioid Settlement Memorandum of Agreement. A copy of this is included in your packet for today. Let's see if I can figure out how to like this. Yeah. Okay. Everybody? We can go to the next one. Alrighty. So just to do an overview of the settlement, um, thousands of U.S. communities will receive recovery funds from the historic $26 billion National Opioid Settlement. Um, these funds from the opioid settlement are required to be utilized only for opioid re remediation activities to battle the opioid crisis. The North Carolina Memoran Memorandum of Agreement, or the MOA, was created with the intention to facilitate compliance by state and local governments with the terms of the national settlement. The MOA serves as a guide for the funding, allowable remediation activities, special revenue fund, transparency requirements, auditing, reporting, and accountability. Of the $750 million that North Carolina will receive, 15% will be allocated to the state for the General Assembly to appropriate. 85% of the settlement funds will go to local governments, all 100 counties and 17 municipalities. Alrighty, on this slide, just to note, um, there was an error um, on this slide with the dollar amount, so I've corrected that in this presentation um, on this slide here. So. Um, Alamance County is going to receive $8,874,933 or $8.9 million over 18 years. This funding will be front loaded the first three years. Um, we could receive payment as early as the spring of 22 for $340,964 and a second payment this summer for $749,845, a total of $1.1 million. Currently, there's no specific time frame for these funds to be spent, so we do have time to think this through. Um, here is a slide um, that is just the estimate of the 18-year payment schedule for Alamance County. Um, this slide can be found, and this information can be found on the North Carolina Opioid Settlement website under our data dashboard. Um, if you're looking at this slide, you will see that the, front, the first three years, you will see that they are front-loaded. Then the following years are also a little bit higher weighted, and then around 2033 is when it levels out to around roughly $400,000 for the remaining time frame of the settlement. Um, the North Carolina MOA requires a special revenue fund um, for the receipt and expenditure of these opioid settlement funds. These funds cannot be commingled with other county funds and require a budget resolution to expend the funds. Andrea Rollins and our wonderful county finance department has already um, established this fund and the ordinance is included in your agenda packet today. 
Um, so commissioners, when you're ready to spend these funds, which is not a decision that we um, that you will need to make today, um, but when you're ready, the following information must be included in the budget line or in the budget resolution to authorize the expenditure of the opioid settlement funds. Um, you must state the specific strategy or strategies the county intends to fund pursuant of option A or B using the item letter and or number in exhibit A or B and state the amount dedicated to each strategy and for the stated specific stated period of time. Um, so we are going to be held accountable for these funds um, in numerous different ways. The MOA, MOA outlines seven different ways um, that they are going to hold us accountable um, for the expenditure of these funds. Um, so in addition to our annual financial reports, each county is required to report to the statewide opioid dashboard. This dashboard is to designed to provide transparency of our budget, strategic planning, annual finance reports, and any impact information. Our, we will have um, a coordination group that our information will be reported to that's going to consist of 12 members, five local government representatives, four experts that are appointed by the Department of Health and Human Services, um, an expert appointed by the Attorney General of North Carolina, one expert appointed from the North Carolina University of North Carolina School of Government, and one representative from the Board of North Carolina Institute of Medicine. The responsibilities of this group will be to ensure audit compliance, county, expenditure, county expenditures match those described in Exhibit A and B, if the reporting requirements were followed, and whether any subrecipient utilized the funds for the stated purpose consistent with the MOA. And lastly, we will be required to report impact information. Um, the impact information is going to include a progress report, short stories, one or more process measures, one or more quality measures, and more um, outcome measures. Um, so we will be including um, information that's directly related to this, those that we are serving and the impact that it's making. Um, so for our county and for all counties, we um, must hold one um, annual meeting with all municipalities within the county to receive input on proposed usage of these settlement funds and to encourage collaboration. This meeting will be open to the public. Thank you. As a proposed date <laughs> been set for this uh, annual meeting? Um, no, sir. That would be determined by you all. Okay. Um, and so, um, just to briefly talk about the options and the activities that are, uh, that are available. Um, so, option A um, for this, there's two options, option A and option B. Option A is a shorter list of evidence-based high-impact opioid abatement strategies. Option B includes a broader list of categories and contains the initial opioid rem remediation strategies listed in the national settlement. Um, so therefore option A, um, these funds can be used to create, expand, or sustain program services or activity. Um, and many of these strategies are um, already in existence in Alamance County and various parts of North Carolina and other counties. Um, so evidence-based addiction treatment, recovery support services, recovery housing support, employment-related services, early intervention, naloxone distribution, post-overdose response teams, syringe service programs, criminal justice diversion programs, and addiction treatment for incarcerated persons. Option B is the much broader list. Um, for option B, the one difference in option A is for option A, in order to engage in any of those strategies, a strategic plan does not have to be conducted prior. Um, for option B, we do have to engage in a strategic plan, and the um, strategic plan is described in Exhibit C um, for how that would look before we can engage in any of these options. Um, so for option B, I'm sure you notice that it is 10 pages in the MOA. It is very detailed. Um, I just listed a summary. Essentially, we are looking at treatment, prevention, and other strategies. Um, this allows us to look into um, treatment for um, women who are pregnant who have opioid use disorder. This is going to allow us to look at all forms of medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, um, as well as looking into strategies as far as leadership and planning and the coordination of how we approach 
we approach this huge um, epidemic that we're up against. Um, from the health department, our recommendation includes three parts. Um, one is to hold the annual meeting with the municipalities to solicit their feedback, um, get a perspec their perspective, any gaps and barriers that are we're presented with. And that leads into our second recommendation, to hold a strategic planning process with a diverse group of state court st stakeholders appointed by the commissioners. Um, strategic planning will allow Alamance County to build upon any related funding um, of related planning or services already in place. Identify the key factors, explore the root cause, identify and evaluate potential strategies um, to identify any gaps in our existing efforts, prioritize our strategies and identify our goals, measures, evaluation, planning, and to consider ways to align these strategies. Identify the organizations um, to develop our budget and our timelines and report our official recommendations to you commissioners. Um, and this will be in a non-binding agreement, of course. Um, or non-binding document for you guys to review and to approve based on um, what you guys feel are priorities. And then um, as a part of that strategic planning, um, we would say that we would like to see the strategic plan take place over the next six months. Um, and lastly, we would like you to consider the results from that strategic plan to then determine options A or B, A and or B, um, to begin to put these programs in place. Um, is the help as part of our health recommendation we feel that engagement in this planning process will help us to develop a long-term plan with the greatest impact for Alamance County citizens whose lives have been adversely impacted by opioids um, and just to recap um, so we need to, we need the fund to be established with a special revenue um, that has been taken place and it's before you today um, to, for your approval um, to hold our municipalities meeting um, with all in the county uh, to consider the options and recommendations then identify the strategies and authorize the budget item budget line item or budget resolution and then to proceed with reporting and accountability um, I'm happy to answer any questions as I'm able um, and if not I will take down questions or Deborah is able to help well I'll, I'll start because I'm <coughs> Um, I was reading over all this last night mm -hmm. and I'm looking at all the different things like support people in treatment and recovery and you know what I'm going to ask. Um, we took a team to Orange County about the recovery court process mm -hmm. and we met with all various leaders, amazing people went with us. Judge Brown, Judge Hanford, Judge Lambeth was in here. Um, we've got strong support in that and we and a, a former county manager uh, Mr. Haygood thought that this could be a part of supporting that kind of recovery court mm -hmm. because we have definitely got the right people here to conduct this it's just getting it implemented the structure the scheduling mm -hmm. and all that and I'm just curious is that something that could fall under some of these um, listings of what it would go to pay for that was not what was initially considered mm -hmm. when we came up with all the A and the B and when yeah. I say we that involved the five county attorneys on yeah. the statewide committee, Department of Justice, and NCACC. At the same time, I'm not saying it's a no because it wasn't considered. I don't think it would be under option A. And when you make a decision as a county to go under option A or option B, there is a, as Ashley has correctly gone through, a lot more paperwork, a lot more things that go into if you go through option B, not to dissuade you, just, just awareness. So we're, we're working to find out and we're, start, we're just starting to get those things in. So it's really important to bring that up so that we can communicate back to the group and say, okay, where, where is this going to fall? Because of course, as you know, no one yet has gotten the money. Yeah. Um, I just approved <coughs> last week the distribution. The five of us had to do that for Department of Justice. Um, we're hoping by doing that, we're gonna get our first check in May, but I can't promise because it is coming from the defendant's <laughs> fund allocated through that settlement. Uh, that the judge did in Ohio. Um, and of course, just again as a reminder, that first check that we <coughs> get is from three defendants that we've settled with. That other check Ashley mentioned will be the fourth defendant we settled with, and that'll likely not be until September. But there's still a number of other defendants out there. These are the bigger ones. And then of course we have Purdue Pharma and Malincrod, and we're working on the bankruptcy cases, which is Hopefully we're going to get some money, but in a, a different way. 
That's all to be said. There's a lot that still is unknown because we're at the very beginning of it, but I've taken notes that I'm going to take it back to our next meeting with NCACC to ask that very question. Would it consider, would it cover something like this? And ultimately, the question will be answered by those 12 people that Ashley mentioned. It is that board that's going to run and distribute and approve and answer questions just like that. That board has not been finalized yet. I know, it's, just, it's so important to understand the aspects. I'm going to be taking someone to Goldsboro this week because there's nowhere here. I'll go anywhere to get someone help. But at the same sense, Goldsboro, this person isn't, isn't going to be in a bar so they can walk away. We've had some that will go and commit and graduate. Oh my gosh, they get their lives back. Then you have some that will stay two hours and they run. Then you have to find them in another county to get arrested. It's, it's just a nightmare for a person going through this. But with recovery court, you've got your own personal person that holds you accountable and a group that supports you. And you're going to go back to jail if you don't. I mean, we've seen it when we went to Orange County and Chapel Hill for that. There's just a lot of different avenues when it comes to battling this disease, and that is exactly what it is as a disease. Whether we want to call it that or not, like alcoholism or anything, it overtakes a person. So I hope this is something that we really got on fire about this, because Judge Brown's a friend of mine, personal friend, and so is Judge Hanford. And they faced this in a court. I was in the courtroom three weeks ago and watched a guy just about fall out of the pew because he was so enormously high. I went and got help. I thought he was going to just pass out right there. And then I had pictures sent to me of needles in the grass at our courthouse. So just because it's a courthouse, there's no magical boundary that drugs aren't walking in the courthouse. I went marching my little self over to the sheriff. I know you dress seeing me come. And I said, can we get a dog at the, the bottom? Because they can pick up your gun or your knife when you walk through, but they can't pick up anything else that you may have on you. And, I, you know, until we really go to war with this, you can arrest users and homeless that are users every day, every time you turn around and they're going to go in and out of the jail. And the overdoses that we are getting are just, they're real. It's, it's just, it's bad. That's our new terrorist is drugs. And so whatever we got to do, it's unbelievable that people who make drugs are paying all this money for people that have gotten addicted to their drugs and they're still open making more drugs. So what does that say? So I just hope that we keep this on the table because our ju judges were really fired up about something like this to bring this in. We're not Orange County. We don't start out that big, but we start out, we try because um, every life is valuable. If it's your kid, your parent, your brother, whatever, you want them better. And this is not an easy war to battle. So I just, just keep that in your notes for recovery court. Like a broken record, that's what I represent is a broken record. A couple of questions. Is it possible to take a net present value from some of these funds and use them for a project such as the Divergence Center? Or to set aside an annual portion of the funds for debt service on something like the Divergence Center? Debt service is, is not clear. So that is on the list and that has come from a couple of other counties as well. Um, you, we, you can't start depending on budgeting the money until we know the check is here. All right. And so that presents <coughs> challenges because, again, when you're looking at a settlement payout over 18 years, things can happen with companies. It, in a way, it's easier, it's terrible that, that the companies have gone bankrupt and they're not paying their fair share. But nonetheless, at least when we get that, that will be a sum certain. Over 18 years, as you all know, companies can go bankrupt. And so there's no guarantee even of those future monies. And so that's why this strategic planning process that Ashley talked about is required because we're going to have to deal with a lot of the uncertainty. So there's going to be a lot of limitations long term as to what you can do. And that's why debt ser service set off is the unknown at this moment in time. So essentially we've got it, but we don't know for sure we've got it. You've got it, you're not sure how you're going to be able to spend right. it yet, I would say, is how I would put it. I just hope this money can go directly to the person that has a problem. Directly to serving them and their needs as much as possible. And those folks who are doing that work. 
I have a couple of questions, but I'll, I'm going to defer to Mr. Lashley. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Turner, my question would be to legal counsel and to our health director, are you recommending option A or option B? It's too soon. I think the, the strategic plan that she has mentioned is so critical. You want to get people at the table talking about all the different ideas because you've got a lot of folks in this community that know a lot about this issue, yeah. but they have different perspectives. So the benefit of getting that in place first is to really examine all that and work with the municipalities and figure out what collectively are our ideas to come together before we make that decision about which prong we're going to pick. So you're recommending that one, we set up the fund today yes, and then defer on the second uh, second question. Correct. Then I'll make a motion. One more thing, John, just to add to that. It's got some things about our youth and our schools and all that. And I know I can get Sheriff Johnson to stand up there and preach about vaping and uh, weed, because weed's got about five E's in it now. And um, the drugs issues we have in our schools, please don't think they're not there. <laughs> and they get younger and younger. So the more you can do for your young people, the more you're building your future to really somehow curb this. Because um, everybody's savable, but your young people are your future. They're going to take care of all of us one day. So I highly suggest we have them well equipped and well healthy when it comes to stuff like this. Because they are putting all kinds of stuff in their little vaping pods. and. Um, I'm just waiting on that one big drug that starts with an F to start getting in that as well because it seems to make its way into everything else and you're going to have kids dropping like flies. So it's, we need to go after it. I'm moving that we approve an ordinance to budget $8,874,733 of opioid settlement funds establishing a new revenue fund so as not to co-mingle these funds with any other monies or funds. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. And I move secondly that we defer uh, the consideration of the settlement uh, fund spending strategies into a later session. Does that require a motion, Mr. Chairman, or can we just... I'm not sure that it does. No, does that doesn't does not. require a motion. Then let's move to the next item. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Did you have something to share? Yeah, I was going to ask commissioners if you were um, comfortable with uh, directing the health department to go ahead and start planning for that annual municipalities meeting um, regarding the opioid settlement funds. I think that would be a good idea, but I think we need legal counsels you have so much information that we don't have uh, regarding the timing and things of that sort. So I'll ask that uh, you as county manager and legal counsel set that up as, as appropriate. We will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now comes a fun thing. And would our clerk please come forward? Don't forget she's a master. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically this week. Any guesses? Look at your agenda. Somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we have a proclamation that we board members have all five previously signed. It is right here. I'm going to not read it from here. I'm going to read it from here because it's easier to read. <laughs> and we specifically recognize our board clerk. This is a proclamation of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Um, Shit, board colleagues, me I heard that. <laughs> this is the 53rd Professional Clerks Week. The week itself is May the 1st through May the 7th. Uh, and whereas the Office of the Clerk, a time honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world and whereas the office of clerk is the oldest among public servants and 
whereas the Office of the Clerk provides the link between the citizens, the local governing, governing bodies, and agencies of government at all levels, and whereas clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, and whereas the clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, and whereas clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of the clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and annual meetings of the state, provincial, county, and international organizations, and whereas it's most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of our clerk. Now, therefore, we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do recognize the week of May 1 through 7, 2022, as Professional Clerks Week, and further extend appreciation to our clerk, Tori Crank, and all the other uh, municipal clerks serving their municipal municipalities in Alamance County for their vital services they perform and their exemplary uh, dedication to the communities they represent. This, the second day of May, 2022, thank you. And don't need glasses for this. Thomas, you can take a picture, sir. <laughs> Thank you. And that's yours. <laughs> to have the glasses but they sure come in handy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Ms. Hook, you're next. Sure. Uh, representatives from Veterans Community Project are here by Zoom. Um, they are just going to present information on their organization, and this is an informational item. Good morning, um, Alamance County County Commissioners. Uh, Vincent Vinnie Morales, co-founder of Veterans Community Projects, along with uh, Jerry McDaniels, um, the National Expansion Member. Uh, thank you for having us uh, this morning, and uh, we'd like to take some time here to tell you about our project, and then open the floor for some quick questions. So about six years ago, myself and several other combat veterans came together and we seen a, a large gap in services. A lot of our brothers and sisters were falling through the cracks, whether they were VA eligible or not. And uh, we just got frustrated with it and took it upon ourselves to, to fix the solution, to find a solution, to say yes before saying no. And what that looked like for us was a model of tiny homes with wraparound services. A lot of questions that we get asked uh, is, well, they're veterans, can't they go to the VA? Uh, I would love to say yes. That is as simple as that, but there are so many roads to navigate to make an individual VA eligible. So for our programming and how we operate, anybody that raises their right hand and has a discharge paperwork, no matter what is on it, is a veteran. And on top of that, we created low barrier housing. So what we found is that a lot of veterans were on the street and would not go to shelters. And that was because we were asking them to leave their only family, their four-legged friends, or they may not be eligible for the family housing to be available, which is really huge in, in the homeless community. I cannot ask somebody who's uh, facing housing instability sleeping in his car with his, his spouse, his dependent, their children, to come into a nice warm shelter and leave their loved ones behind. So we've created low barrier housing where we have family housing, we are pet friendly, and our definition of veteran allows individuals to erase that stigma of 
I'm not a veteran because I didn't deploy. I'm not a veteran because of X factor. I'm not a veteran because of whatever they may have been told in the past. For us, due to the fact that we let us have one half of 1% volunteers serve our country, they took the hardest challenge of all, which was raising their right hand, bringing them on to, you know, bringing them into the indoctrination process and volunteering to serve their country. So for us, they are a veteran. I can tell you with our growth right now, we have a, a village fully operational in Kansas City, Missouri, a village being built in Longmont, Colorado, right outside Denver proper, a village being built in <coughs> St. Louis, Missouri, groundbreaking within the next 30 days in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and the project going forward in uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. We have several other cities that we're looking at, but our goal is to identify amazing cities such as yours who understand the need, who understand the need and want to rise to that challenge to make sure that no veteran gets left behind. Once again, the the overall understanding is that there are better they can go to the VA. I truly wish it was that simple. And I can get into the, to the details of why individuals cannot, that's needed. But that's our goal here is to say yes to veterans before anything else. And we will figure out everything else out from there. And I can say that with our programming thus far, with our housing ratio alone, we are at 82% successful transition ratio. That is double the national average. So for those who are, are understanding how um, continuum of cares work, permanent housing, supportive housing, transitional housing, the average rate is about 30 to 35%. So we've doubled the national average within the time of being a nonprofit only in our fifth year. I, I can talk veterans community project all day, um, but I really would like to answer any questions that are available, any questions that may be out there, um, please. I've got some questions, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, just a couple questions. What is attractive about Alamance County to the Veterans Community Project? What is attractive about Alamance County is the fact that where Alamance County is located from a need standpoint is the fact that there is a huge need there. That you guys are in a geographic dense spot to where you have a lot of military and or Department of Defense agencies to the East Coast in the form of the Marine Corps. Fort Bragg to the to the west and where you guys are specifically located, the veterans in that area have to travel up to Tri County, up the up the, the region to get services. There is nowhere directly where they can receive those direct hands-on services. Now there is an amazing referral system in place via the Veterans Bridge Home. They, that, that agency is amazing. They do a lot of great work. But when a veteran is in that crisis need or that crisis mode. Sometimes it's always amazing to just to have an individual there to speak face to face. I know that the Alamance County Veteran Service Officers do an amazing, amazing job there. They are they're on the ground. They're boots on the boots on the ground. We've visited with them, but they, they can even tell you that they are um, at this point overwhelmed. So where we come in and, and our our goal of our project is to complement, not compete. So where we do a needs assessment and we understand where we can be of a help and of assistance, that's the gaps that we would fill, not an existing service that is already there. Do you have a sense of the scale of the problem of homeless veterans just in Alamance County? Yes, uh, via the last uh, point in time count, which was actually deflated due to COVID and so on and so forth, I think Alamance County was in 60 to 70 individuals. Two years past that, it was in the 120 to 150. Now, I also understand the way the continuum of care count goes there, and I may be incorrect, that uh, it's about the state. So I can say that from the data we've looked at, the time we spent there, the connections that we made, on any given night in Alamance County, you're probably looking between 120 and 140 individuals, veterans, who are facing homelessness. Do you have a sense of the scale of the problem in the, the broader region outside of Alamance County? You mentioned the, the folks we might draw from, like being as far as Fort, Fort Bragg and uh, just others in the region. So uh, statewide, I want to say statewide, last count, and I do apologize if I have that number direct offhand, but it was in the three to 400 range. Um, what we also do, and you brought up a very amazing point, is that look at 
the surrounding continuum of cares, to understand their numbers, to understand what that may look like for our village size. So overall, Alamos County, North Carolina, Central Carolina is doing a really good job of keeping veterans um, alive. But our goal is to keep them alive and transition them onto a productive member of society. That's where our program is, it just differentiates from a lot of other programs, where we are not a cookie cutter, one size fits all. We love keeping our vets alive, that's our goal, but we wanna make sure they're living their fullest and most productive lives once they get out. We assist with that full transition. Uh, last question is, I know when you guys came, you guys met with, met with the Elements Chamber, um, and there was some talk about uh, connecting you all with um, an organization that helps with the capital campaign locally mm -hmm. and just wondering about what have you have you talked to a capital campaign funding group have you gotten any feedback about private donations that that kind of that kind of questioning about about how you might fund this in addition to county dollars so at this time we did meet uh with the capital campaign um, group and we have not had any follow-on conversations we were uh kind of in a whole pattern to have this meeting see how we should just go forward with it uh, and to see if Alamance County truly wants to step up to the challenges and wants veterans community projects to come and give their services there. So we have not had all conversations. We've had initial conversations, so we have not recorded or started any of our, our donor processes yet. Do you typically fund a particular site with with local uh, philanthropic dollars, or, or do you fundraise throughout the nation and then and then send money from your, 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 your bigger fundraising effort to the individual sites? So the way we fundraise is each individual city will have their capital campaign and it is localized there. So VCP um, the County would be um, staffed by local individuals, staffed by veterans in the area, staffed by the community. The funds are raised there locally and they're kept there locally. We do not um, franchise out veterans community projects for lack of better terms. We have each city, each location is LLC out in order for headquarters to have that quality control of our programming and to make sure that we're assisting the veterans the way that we've seen time and time again has worked. So everything there is local and central and we will keep it that way as the project continues. If it's successful, do you, do you see veterans from other parts of the region coming to the center once you, know, once you reach Alamance County folks? So to be 100% honest, we do account in for a five to seven percent growth um, within that, and that is also inclusive of the way we define veteran. A lot of individuals may not receive services because of their veteran status. With our status being uh, low barrier, we will bring individuals into the area, and within your guys' region, the uh, the domiciliaries, some of the housing some of the housing programs that are set up are either too far, two or three hours to the east or west or north. So we, we do anticipate a five to seven percent growth of whatever that may look like. All right. And and really this is the last question. Uh, you, you guys are asking for six point five million. I assume it doesn't matter to you how that money comes. Is that right? I mean whether it's private, whether it's public, whether it's state, whether it's federal, I'm assuming that doesn't matter. Is that right? Well the the honest truth is it does not matter, but we'd love we'd love to keep it with as, as, as least restrictions as possible. Every dollar that we save towards building infrastructure and keeping it restricted allows us to go back into the program. We run really lean as an organization. Um, our case management ratio is, is a one to 10 ratio, which is why we're so successful. Our staff is not, we're, we're not you know, a national agency at the point where we have 30 to 40 individuals per each city. Um, we keep it as lean as possible. So yes, we, of course, would love any funding that comes without restrictions. That's always our goal because it goes back into the program. Now, if we, we have no problem proving in every city that we've accomplished this task in, if there is no um, funding available, then we will roll our sleeves and uh, hit the streets and hit the community, connect with our community and make sure that they know that this is for their community and raise those dollars locally. That's what equity into this program is what made us successful in every city that we've been in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of, couple of quick questions. Um, as I recall, the, the meeting we had, I can't even remember when it was, like late last year, early this year. Um, this year. 
the end implication was that you had a network of corporate sponsors that would come into play in this program and that I, I, I remember hearing a number like about eight million dollars that it might cost but the implication and the presentation we got initially was that you weren't going to be asking for any county dollars but now you're coming and asking for six and a half million plus about three million dollars worth of real estate roughly nine to ten million dollars um, all from the county as opposed to any corporate or private funding that you might have been able to try and work through a capital campaign is there a reason that you've changed your strategy in this? So for for the design of the of the village and the community center, the number of houses, that, that, that has not been conceptualized at this time. I can tell you that for our for the decision to move forward with Dallas County is would, would be huge to have the partnership and the assistance of the county. We have no problem rolling up our sleeves and raising that capital dollars. When it comes to the corporate sponsors, we only have a couple at a national level. Um, a lot of it would be done at that grassroots local level. We still are in, in that portion of, of, of VCP Alamut County where we would, you know, hire that local campaign committee, make our first hires, and as well compose a local board to raise whatever the county can cannot allocate towards this project. So we do not have a uh, conceptual uh, idea of what the overall budget or cost will be for this village at this time. This, for us, our project is very non-traditional. We want to ensure that we're serving veterans uh, as rapidly and as best as our, as our ability. So if the county is able to match us for the, the bill of maybe eight million and the county can match us, that's huge for us. We truly like to be able to swivel and not be stuck with just one aspect of funding. So it wasn't necessarily a change in our game plan, it is to have a conversation, start these relationships, this conversation to say, what could it look like if there are, is dollars allocated towards this project? So that way we know how much work we have to do on the back end. How many, uh, the, the, the presentation that we had, I showed several schematics of the outline of your project footprint what it would look like how many veterans would you envision that proposed project that's supposedly going to cost about six and a half million how many veterans would you see that serving at any given point in time so for the, the proposal the, the conceptual idea of um, the BCP Alamos County would be about 35 homes uh, and a community center um, now that can change left to right give or take five to ten depending on what we start to narrow down the numbers and those will also be anywhere between 10 to 15 of those will be family homes so on a given time a full village we will have 35 individuals that we would house on our residential program that is not that does not include our outreach center or any veteran of any area can walk in and receive services the numbers that we have are those that are running thus far last year we served over 3,500 vets through our walk-in center, and we had housed uh, over 70 at that point thus far. I do not have the data for you for this year, but at this point in time, we have successfully transitioned onto permanent houses so since our inception, 95 veterans. So the number will fluctuate, and that is just based upon our ability to fill the village and successfully transition individuals out because. We know what we are and what we are not. We are a transitional housing facility. We are not an inpatient facility. We're not outpatient. We do not do assisted living. We understand what our, who we can and cannot serve. And we make sure that we are paired with community partners that can serve individuals out of our reach. Because we'd be doing a disservice to our brothers and sisters if we said that we were a substance abuse facility. And that's not how we operate. We want to make sure our brothers and sisters are getting the best care, whether it's through the VA, Veterans Bridge Home, any social services that are out there. That is key to our success, key to the veterans community success, to be honest, is that ability to pair with individuals in their given specialty. Thank you. Mr. Lashley? No, I'm good. Uh, Craig asked one of my questions and Steve just asked the other one, so I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Thompson? Hey, Vinny. How's it doing? It's so good to see you guys. Um, I would just like for you to tell the audience, like if 
I'm living in my car and you and I get to you guys. What are you going to do for me? What services are you going to provide for me besides the bed I'm going to get to finally lay my head on? So what, what we want to do is every, every veteran in their journey is unique. They, we have basically three types of individuals that may encounter or walk the other. VA eligible veterans who may not be eligible for those services for whatever reason that may be trying to upgrade that. And then the individual who's not going to qualify for any VA services. No matter where they have their walk of life, our case management plan is designed and catered to fit them custom. So my needs versus all the commissioners' needs are different. So my housing need may be a one bedroom a market rate studio. And you know, panel of years may be a house with three or four bedrooms because you have children, grandchildren, et cetera. Our goal is to identify what that veteran can and is eligible for and does want and progress them towards that goal. So the oldest in some of our villages has been 91 years old. The youngest has been 20, an individual who is still on the guard at the time. We cannot expect a 91-year-old individual to get a job, start a second life, and do all the other things that happen there. We want to make sure that whatever their next stage of life is, we assist them in that journey, whether that's uh, assisted living, whether that's estate planning, and the, the young individual, we're making sure that they are getting their educational benefits applied for, and then execute it, and then assist them with moving into what that job may or may not be and what their permanent housing solution looks like. So other than the fact that we're giving them a tiny home, we are giving them, this is huge for our program, community. That's something that we are truly giving our veterans in, in our village is that sense of community. For those that served and understand that sense of community when you have when you're in service, that's something that individuals lose in the transition, which is why a lot of individuals fall through the cracks. They don't know who to ask. They don't know where to go. In our program, they have that direct community with that case management staff, with our daily staff, and they have it with each other in the village. Our community is designed so that the individual to the left and right, they have a battle buddy program. So that way I'm accountable to Jared, Jared's accountable to me, and we're also accountable to, to the community and the case management system, which allows the village to organically protect itself and grow as a team. What we love about our program is that individuals come back on the regular. We have on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have coffee hour. We have veterans that have transitioned on to their permanent housing solution that come back every Tuesday and Thursday to get that sense of community. And that's huge when it comes to loving to their spirits, their, their moral spirit, their, their civic obligation is huge. It gives them a sense of purpose and that is that family. Community is in our name for a reason but it's also one of those magical things that we kind of take for granted every single day of our life and we don't realize it. And could you just elaborate on some of the things that are inside the center? Because when I went into the community center, it was amazing what collaborations you had going on inside for the veteran. So as I mentioned, we have individuals who may qualify for VA, individuals who may not. We also have um, our four-legged friends that are available that come in, that come with our individuals. So we end up having, uh, in one of all, all our locations, we have a dentist office uh, where individuals can come and provide on-the-spot dental services for those who want to have those services available. We have, and this is what everyone always loves, the ability to take care of four-legged friends, a uh, pet wash, a dog wash, a veterinary clinic, a fellowship hall where they gather every Tuesday and Thursday for the coffee hours where we will have community-centric events. This coming week, there's actually a single mile potluck. The community gets together. We have an educational center where individuals can come in. If it's job serving, they can have assistance with their case management. If it's navigating e-benefits or my little event, our case managers will assist them with that. We also have a training kitchen, which is huge because we take for granted that we have a stove. We take for granted that we know how to get up and cook every single day. For individuals facing housing instability, they know where to go to get child. They know where to go to receive these services. So we are retraining them on their life skills, teaching them how to cook what's in their cabinet, teaching them how to cook in general. And it's really that life retraining, giving them the ability to live on their own and be self-sufficient, which is what the goal of our program is. Because when we started this, a lot of these programs, which are amazing, not to knock any other program, but they are a band-aid on a broken leg. The recidivism rate was, was outstanding. We would see 
same individuals come into the programs every year, year and a half, two years. Where we're at now with our program, we are mending that broken leg and individuals are able to continue on with their life. And that's what's huge about our program, changing that aspect of it. Because it's, if I can use military terms, it's life boot camp. We're going through life boot camp. We are retraining them to understand how to be self-sufficient, re-tap that inner warrior, and tap into that esprit de corps and give them the ability and the tools to be a functional member of society and continue on. And that's amazing to see that. And I just want to add, because um, I'm friends with Veterans Community Project on Facebook, and I see every time I turn around, various groups in um, Kansas City and close by that um, constantly contributing financial donations and your enormous volunteer squad. So what has that really done for the village? That's allowed us to honestly run, as we were saying, run really lean where we have those volunteer opportunities. Where individuals have the opportunity, if they choose so, to donate, sponsor a house, and if it's a corporate organization, they can come out and they can spend that time. What, what's happened with the veteran population is that it's, the veteran population becomes very standoff, which is kind of the next thing, and, and individuals are apprehensive to have a normal conversation with the veteran because they think that they may trigger or enact them. And that, to a certain extent, could be true. But we create these opportunities for rock colleges here right now in, in, in our village here in St. Louis, the University of Missouri St. Louis is volunteering, but they create the opportunities to engage daily with those who serve our country. And that lets them know that in the village that individuals care for that. That is a part of the magic of the program. People know that everybody appreciates a veteran, but in a daily life, they see it at a ball game. They say, oh, there's a veteran here, please stand, and that's... But most people want to do more than just stand up at a ball game. They want to do more than say thank you for your service. They get the opportunity to come down to our village and be a part of that, whether it's, whether it's um, cutting the grass in the village, painting the house, assisting some of our village, or some of our, our veterans in the village with uh, financial ed education or literacy, or just a sense of community, knowing that somebody's there for that. We actually just had last week a group of individuals come through, and obviously springtime, we're planting flowers in the village, which is amazing. In our uh, Longmont and St. Louis villages, we are 60 days out and already lining up volunteers to be able to swing a hammer and help frame these houses. So that's huge for where we're at in both of those locations. Everybody, the, the analogy I love to use, most of us have a, a carpenter or a woodworker or somebody in our family, and you're ever driving down the road, and they say, I built that porch, I helped build that. That is the opportunity that we are giving the community to be a part of this project. And 20 years down the road, you'll be driving with your grandchildren, your children, and they'll say, I helped build that village. I swung the hammer, I painted that house. That is community, the community being invested. That is generational differences, generational change, and it's amazing to see. Thank you, Danny. May I ask a question? Yes. I think not at this point. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. We thank you. Uh, we all love vets, as you have seen from Alco Vets, our first speaker. Thank you. Uh, we've re been requested to have a 10 minute recess. We're in recess for 10 minutes. Yeah. Miss Evans. I think you're next. Well, actually, the sheriff is going to be yeah. presenting. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I'm morning. Here, here before you today to ask you to allow us to apply for a non-match grant for the state uh, criminal alien assistance program, which is a yearly thing that the state gives, and this is to be used in the detention center for whatever needs are uh, in the detention center, and. Uh, not guaranteed we'll get 50,000, but I uh, need to ask for your permission to apply. Like I said, there is no match. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 She she unanimous. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> we like short and sweet. <laughs> He's got half of it good. Ms. Evans, I, Terry, I, I, I apologize. You were not on my agenda. So <laughs> I'll be you are now. That's fine. <laughs> Ms. Evans, are you next? 
actually is our health director. Okay. That's that's not what I'm showing. <laughs> so right here it's showing. Yeah, mine says. Uh, Have you got the one they put at your it's, it's the desk or one you printed yeah, like yeah. underneath That's that brown folder right Just there? Just switched. Yeah. I've it's got true. him this, this second and I've had Susan as first. Yes, sir. Go All ahead. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, commissioners, before you, is looking to amend the budget, the amount of $37,684. This is additional funding we received from the Division of Public Health, Environmental Health Section, and Food Protection Facilities Branch. There is no cost match. There is no out-of-state travel required. And we'll actually use this money to purchase a new vehicle and uh, rotate it through our fleet. What does your fleet look like? Like, is it... Bradley's. What's your, what's your fleet look God, like? you're, you're loading this up with all the I'm, cool stuff. I'm FBI, FBI Bradley's, FBI. all this good stuff today. So, um, yeah. I mean, do you have cars, vans? We have cars. So for our environmental health, in particular, they typically do CRVs or pickups. Okay. So they have all-wheel drive because they go out into that rough terrain. Eventually, it trickles down to our regular health fleet. That's kind of how we do our rotation because they do a lot of the driving in the environmental health world. Um, and then we have a few other cars. We have some of the sheriff's old cars in our fleet, so on and so forth. So, but our old, oldest vehicles um, back from 2000. So it's barely hanging on. Is it on. like a decoy? It is barely hanging on. <laughs> Sting operation. Okay. He wishes he had some Bradley. <laughs> I'll make the motion. So much. So. Uh, second. Excuse me. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you, sir. Am I caught up on the agenda? My yeah. mind is not what what we're doing. All right. Thank you. So public speakers are next. Um, Ms. Williams? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Ramona Williams. Um, I live in Graham. Um, and my mother is um, a participant at Friendship Adult Day Services. I'm here to ask um, the commissioners to maybe rethink your um, the funding that was asked for in behalf of the Friendship Adult Day Center. Um, you know, I had this, I'm just going to go away with it. I mean, I've been sitting in here, I've listened to $8 million from the, you know, our drug problem in Alamance County. I'm listening to the veterans, $6.5 million for funding, and believe me, I get it mental illness, drugs, the veterans homeless in Alamance County, it's all a big problem. But I'm scared that we're losing sight of our elderly population in Alamance County also. You know, what they asked for, and um, don't quote me on this, but I don't think this facility has ever asked the county for any money before. I, I, I don't think so. And the amount that they're asking for to keep them open is, minuscule to what we're talking about in this room. My mother has so much, I mean, she's 86 years old, and my dad was in the 82nd Airborne in World War II. I mean, I get all of these problems, but I'm, I'm just scared that, you know, they took care of all of us when we were young. They did what they had to do. It takes a village. We all, it, this is all of our problem, and it's not going anywhere. This growing population of our older community is only going to get worse. Um, they opened up again today, and my 86-year-old mother was dancing in the house this morning. She just loves this place. My mother has Alzheimer's. I'm her only caregiver. Um, what this place means to so many elderly and mentally disabled people in our county is it, just, I mean, the people that work there, we can take our, our family members there and know that they are being taken care of. These people work to love and take care of these people. Um, and they're just asking for a little, uh, you, you know, just to keep them open until the state kicks back in. Um, when COVID hit, these this woman called me and my mother every single day from Monday to Friday. 
she checked on us. She told us about programs that what we could do and everything. These people care about our loved ones. And I, I mean, I just want to see this facility um, succeed because it is such a vital part of our community, um, along with, you know, us doing things for the veterans, the mentally ill, the drugs. You know, my nephew was the first person in 2021 of the year to be murdered in Alamance County. I mean, you know, I get everything that's going on in Alamance County, but let's please don't forget our elderly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I was under the impression that they got the financing they needed from their bank. Was they that did, correct? They did. Yes, but with, I'm sorry, but with you guys giving a little, they can pay those people back and they don't have to rack up interest in, in, in anything like that. I mean, it, it, they're worth every, our elderly is worth every dime of it. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Spears. Good afternoon to the commissioners now, right? Good morning. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> My name is Tim Spears. I live in Burlington. And um, I'm here to speak on the behalf of Friendship and just give you some personal experience with a program like this. Um, it was this day one year ago I got a phone call from my mother that said her cancer had returned um, she was the main caregiver for uh, my aunt which is Joyce she's here today she's 85 years old um, she was a home birth that experienced trauma and uh, uh, with the forceps and uh, scarred her for life um, I packed up my car that day I kissed my wife goodbye I said I don't know when I'm coming back in seven months I spent with my mother I was taking care of her as she died. I was taking care of my aunt. My aunt had a program uh, there. It's called the Ability Center. She's went through it for several, several years. Uh, this is a community much like Friendship, and it provides so much for my aunt. Um, number one, it gives her friends that are just like her. Number two, it lets them get out in the community. They go to fishing piers. They go bowling. Uh, they do movies. Um, they do dances. Um, it's just, uh, it's, she looks forward to it every single day. Um, upon my mother's death, seven months exactly to the day, uh, you know, choice became my responsibility. Uh, we moved her in with us, which is, it's tough, right? It's uh, an 85-year-old woman that has a five-year-old mental capacity, and it changes our lives. Um, right now, we were looking forward to getting her in the program. We did some research. Um, the, the problem being um, is with nothing being open, her day consists of coming to work with me, sitting in a chair all day watching me work. Uh, we do have some, uh, <laughs> some personal caretakers that come in a couple days a week, but she just doesn't have, she'll tell you every day, I miss it, I miss it, going to CP. She called it CP, going to CP. So, <laughs> there you go, Joyce. But I just wanted to give you a personal experience. I, I know that there's some things that are happening on the back. I know that there's some funding gaps with the friendship between the time that, you know, thank the Lord they were able to open up today. I think there's some funding gaps in terms of when they get some state uh, funding in. But I wanted to give you a personal experience of what it means uh, for someone like that to be around um, people that are like them. And uh, that's basically all I wanted to bring to the table. And we thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. We're now commissioner's responses, if any. Um, when I last spoke, I went over to the the place, took a lot of pictures. It's it's the palace. It's just absolutely beautiful. And as of that day, on Friday or Thursday, whichever it was, they had not received um, their confirmation of their line of credit from their bank. However, Friday, um, they got their certification from the state. So she is open today. But I know that she's probably counting on us to help with that as far as to keep them open until that funding comes in. Um, it, it's, um, I, like I said last week or whenever we said it, um, I just think that we need to do whatever possible, crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's, to help an agency that's been in business for 40 years. That says a lot about anybody can keep a business open for 40 years. And, um, and it's a very very precious population. Um, my dad will be dead 
two years, May, and I had landed the dream job as the director of Families Living Violence Free in Oxford, working with sexual assault and domestic violence. And I was willing to drive every day. It was a great job. You get ready for your job and you leave your job there when you come back home and met the fine people in Oxford and um, great, great community. But um, start, things started happening, and I'm only child, so I was kind of it, and I had to leave that position in five weeks. And I, you, you don't have a choice. You pick your family, but I'm also married, and I wasn't the breadwinner of my house. And so um, we have things that we face like that, and we have to really understand that not everybody has the situations where it always works out good. And if someone can walk into a place that's been really created for them and provided for them, and have a great day from eight to five while that caregiver can go to work and take care of their also other family and pay their bills. Uh, I think that's America. We're supposed to be able to take care of ourselves and have the American dream. And um, I'm 63 and I may be over there one day and I hope they're open so someone can help me to have a better day if there's no one that can really care for me because they have to work. And we all need to realize that We've got to be so careful how we do things because they will often remind us later of, wow, um, I know we have I know we have situations and I know what we have to do is we're legal, we're government, but I um, I, I will never understand this. I just don't because. I just think we really need to think about this because if it was my mother who I'm struggling with right now with some things she's going through and I'm it, it's very difficult and there has to be resources <clears throat> for people to enjoy their day, be cared for, be safe, elder abuse, get the Justice Center up here and they'll talk about elder abuse because um, I could tell you stories when I was at Family Abuse Service about elder abuse and we have to take care of our elderly because um, they were once young and vibrant and protected this country with every kind of war they went through. And I will not let them be forgotten or looked over. Um, so I just, I just think whatever we can do as commissioners, as real leaders of citizens, not just buildings, not just roads, not just everything like that, which is so important, but of our citizens because um, a building didn't vote for me, a road didn't vote for me, a person did. And when I was so blessed to get this position after being on the school board, I take that person very serious. I serve everything, every kind of, every kind of lifestyle, whatever that is, I'm going to be your voice. And, um, and I just hope that we will really take this very serious and do what we can because it's a real reflection of us. That's it. Ms. Bechtel. Yes. Quick question for you. If they're now functioning oper and in operation and permitted, we, our discussion pre previously was whether or not we could issue a contract with this organization and participate with them. Are we in a position now where we could do something like that? I don't know enough about all of the logistics to answer that, but in general, I would say yes. There is ability to do a contract with an existing organization that is open doing business, that is current with the Secretary of State's office, which is a requirement that I always put in place for you to make sure that they're an active corporation. And I'm Beyond sorry that, that give you finance a heads up on laws, that question, I could not <laughs> answer. But we are planning an ARP session <coughs> in the future, near future anyway, uh, and I think all of these money decisions need to be on that agenda. Okay, county manager. I, I, got, I got some questions. All right, I, I just got a statement I want to make. Make it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask the uh, you sort of. I'm, 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 I'm good. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask Sherry because uh, I know what Deborah had just said. Do you? We had talked about this the last meeting, mm -hmm. and the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, now that friendship have is opened. If you look at my comments at the last meeting. I said that if they got open, that was a game changer. Yep. That changes the ball game. What can we do now that they're open? What mm -hmm. can we do? 
So it would go back to the conversations we've had in the past. If they are open and providing services, the county could enter into a contract with them to provide services on the county's behalf. And we can do that. We probably do not want to do that out of ARP money. Mm -hmm. Probably want to do that out of general fund. Sure. Could I just we? emailed Connie, and they have not got their line of credit. <clears throat> they haven't gotten a line of credit. Mm -mm. Ms. Hook, mm -hmm. you're next. Okay. I have no no uh, report at this time. Well, All right. Well, thank you. Uh, well, I, I, hold I, it. I, I got to talk about this. Thank you, Bill. You're I just going to go on like we're not sitting here talking about this when two families come up spilling their guts and their heart about what they're facing? Come on, John. We need to talk about this. I want to talk about the, I want to talk about the finance report. Uh, that's what I want to talk about. But I'll go further. I'll, I'll back up here. Is there anything we can do today to help these folks out? I mean, I know. Um, if, can we do anything the next meeting? If we can't do anything today, can we do something the next meeting? We can do. Uh, we can do something anytime the commissioners uh, ask staff to. I had already worked on a contract with, uh, or started on a contract with them. Deborah has not reviewed that. Connie has not reviewed that. So it would probably let's revert to. I'll relent to Deborah. So Deborah, in your professional opinion, now is not the proper time to take care of this. Well, it's not an agenda. I mean, it needs to be an agenda item okay. for you all to do the typical way you do business. Right. And finance has to look at it, and I have to look at it. So I, I um, I'm not prepared. To Understood. do anything today because I don't even know sitting here their status as a legal corporation. Yes. I don't even know their full legal name. I, I'm sure they are, sure. but those are the things that I typically right. check on. Is sure. what I'm and there saying. were 29 people that came before us when we met down the street at the uh, historic courthouse, and they all were nonprofits as well. Mm -hmm. So who do we do? We just pick one out. They're serving 18 people is what their testimony was. Well, that, that's and now not what I would decide we, we today. support but one I... single nonprofit and just trash all the rest. It doesn't make any sense. We've got to do it in a logical order. Any work that I would do would be the same for any of them that, that you were considering. Thank you. Just remember, we um, helped Family Abuse Services and Crossroads last year because of the importance of what they do. And we're probably going to be looking at maybe possibly helping the Family Justice Center. And none of those 29 agencies that came before us were considered um, to possibly close. And um, we, have, we have really went out for our, our ambulances, our detention officers, our, our everything because of the importance in that. And um, Those aren't nonprofits. <sighs> I understand what they are. I really, really do. Um, <laughs> but I think maybe I'm looking at people instead of businesses or instead of budgets or instead of anything, anything else. And I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there. I prayed this morning to hold my tongue and I'm going to, but I promise you the county is watching. So just remember that. I just, I, get that. I think I'll request that we put that on the agenda Absolutely. for the next meeting. I do too. That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate your Sorry. insight. Now, now Ms. Hood, mm -hmm. we'll try one more time. I have my finance people here with me. So. Excellent. Right. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions about the, the, uh, the management report mm -hmm. as of uh, March 22nd. Uh, I actually just want to, uh, first, I want to uh, point this out to my fellow commissioners. I would really like them to take a hard look at what you provided for this management report. The reason I say that is there's a lot of numbers in here that will lead you to where you need to be next month. Uh, I just wanted to ask two quick questions. But I do want my commissioners to do take a look at that. It's, it's got a lot of valuable information, and it will definitely point you in the right direction when you come to these uh, hard decisions that we have to make next month. Tell me where you are here on the page. Tell me where you are. Oh, uh, let's see. So I, don't, I don't look at it that way, okay. but it's, it's her, um, it's Sherry 
Cook's management report, okay. it's a very, very bottom. Okay. At the very bottom. And it has the uh, general fund highlights. And I would suggest people in the community take a look at this as well. Uh, you got the county workforce, you got the education, you have your debt service. Uh, my question to you is uh, the debt service seems like it's 49.6 of the budget so far and we're 20 we're 25 percent of the way to go mm -hmm. uh do we expect to that number to increase very yes, rapidly sir. we have a debt service payment today in the amount of 10 million dollars so that was for the fiscal year i'm sorry the series 2021 bonds 10 million or 10 million okay that will go out today so that will change that number drastically mm -hmm. excellent so well, that's going to almost take up your rest of your Yes. Yeah, you only have a million left. Okay. And then we'll have one more debt service payment to make in the month of June, and then that will complete our debt service review. And, and then we <coughs> will, uh, just not to get too far ahead of it, but in September we will go through this exercise again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, that's one. Uh, one more. Um, I just want to, um, I think this may be a question for Andrea. I see in your county workforce, you have salary and benefit cost of $50.621 million, and you budgeted 71.9. Uh, is, is the salary number 50.6 and the benefits numbers 22 million? No, of the total amount budgeted of 71 million, we are 70% uh, expended at this point. We don't have it broken down by um, the budget isn't broken down in this report. Okay. We can get that information. For That's you. year to date. Right, year to date, March uh, March thirty first, I believe. Correct. Okay. So my question is, it just looks like that fifty point six million dollar number is the number for the salaries for the county. All right, but it's not. It's not. It's about what two million dollars off, maybe. Well, the, the number that we're reporting here is nine months worth of salary and benefits, and it's coincidentally very close to our total salary. Okay. All right. Does the numbers look familiar? They look similar? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you very much for your help. I'm good. <laughs> I assume that concludes Commissioner comments, which would be next on the agenda. If anybody else wants to say anything, let me know. Okay, County Attorney, thank you. Yes. So it is my pleasure to introduce Reagan Oakley. Uh, she is your new Assistant County Attorney. Reagan joins the community uh, work-wise from the Supreme Court of the North Carolina where she has worked for the last five years as an attorney. She graduated from Elon Law School at the top of her class, um, but her home from birth through today is Alamance County. This is her home. So she's really happy and we're very, very happy to have her come back and work in this wonderful community. So welcome, Ray. Thank, Thank you. Welcome aboard. Yeah. Welcome. Yes, I can't well wait to talk to your boss. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> He's not very happy with us. No, I know he's not. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to rub it in a little bit. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Miss <laughs> right. Oakley, we welcome you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anything else? No. I will move to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor, Thank signify you. by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.tv tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. 
technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.